Yes. Okay. Good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you all for joining us for this important program on fracking. I'm Ruth Bowen, co-chair of the Mainline Unitarian Church's Environmental Justice Team, which is sponsoring this program, along with UU Justice PA, the Unitarian Universalist Legislative Advocacy Organization in Pennsylvania. Uh, we had almost 100 people registered for the program, uh, a number that suggests that fracking has become a highly important and controversial issue for Pennsylvanians. Because of the number of people on the call, we have muted everyone. If you have questions that you would like to ask our speaker, please use the chat box and we will answer those questions after our speaker is finished. We are also going to record the program and at a later date, I'll be sending you a link to access the video. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Colin Jeromek, author of Up to Heaven and Down to Hell, a book that describes what happens when a rural community like the one surrounding Williamsport, PA, confronts the decision on whether to allow fracking. The book will be available at Amazon on April 13th. An environmental sociologist and an associate professor of both sociology and environmental studies at New York University, he's also chair of the Department of Environmental Studies at NYU. He received his PhD in sociology from the City University of New York and was awarded a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Scholars in Health Policy Research Fellowship at Harvard University. And we're delighted to have him. And tonight he will share his research and discoveries uh, that are described in his new book. Colin? Hi, thanks for hosting me. Thanks in particular to Ruth and Pam for uh, getting, getting, working with me to get this all arranged. Uh, I, I won't do many acknowledgements and I'm gonna leave out some people, but I wanted to acknowledge my mother, Marion Caricelli, who's here and whose uh, endless promotion of my book, which is still six months away, uh, led to this talk. I see that my brother Doug is here. And then uh, some folks from Williamsport, in particular, Ralph Kisberg and Barb Jarmaska, who uh, Ralph co-founded and Barb has been an early member of the Responsible Drilling Alliance and are my friends who uh, gave me information and friendship and solidarity when I was uh, out in Williamsport. So uh, yeah, so we'll jump right into it. I'm gonna hop back and forth between screen sharing and not, I don't really wanna leave slides up the whole time. So I'll pop on some pictures and then I'll take them away. Um, so we'll, we'll see how that works, but I'll, I'll try it right now. So um, if I ever had to leave this property, I'd suck on a gun barrel. George Hagemeyer, 58-year-old retired custodian and proud country boy, uttered these words as he was staring out the kitchen window of his modest farmhouse at the large swath of field once tended by his father. When George was just two years old, his father was out with hanging plastic over that very window that he was looking out on as his mother cooked dinner when his father fell off the ladder, hit his head on a rock, and died. His mother, took, his mother took him as his head bled out and his seven children in the car to the hospital and he died en route. George was only two years old. George never left home and he stayed. He helped his mom raise a girl that his sister was going to give up for adoption. And then he cared for his mother until her own death in 2008. A bachelor to this day, when his mother died, George inherited the land. And he told me that to be the steward of his dad's 77 acre plot, tucked away in a secluded mountain hollow about 20 minutes north of Williamsport was all he ever wanted. When I met George, Anadarko Petroleum Corporation was in the midst of drilling six natural gas wells on several acres of land it had cleared in a field just 800 feet behind his house. It had caused a lot of disruptions. There was, uh, aside from the, the big rigs driving, driving down a gravel driveway that they put right next to his house, there was a security guard shack and a porto potty at the front of his driveway, which he hated and had to drive by uh, each time there was, of course, the noise, uh, there was the light at night. Um, but despite all these disruptions, which he conceded shattered the rural serenity he held so dear, George remarked at that time, I just think it's neat. They ought to make me a spokesperson for what Anne Darko is doing because I'm just so darn thrilled with it. Now, it was, it was sort of clear why that might be the case. When I met George, he was drawing a modest income from his pension as, as a retired janitor, duct tape crisscrossed the, the, the linoleum kitchen the linoleum floor of his kitchen, and his shed was a trailer in his front yard where he had hastily thrown a tarp over the roof to prevent it from leaking. He drove a jalopy, 
But by the time I left Williamsport a year later, he was he had signed a lease and you know he, he had started receiving money from the from the lease on those six gas wells. And his first royalty check, and these are for one, you know, you get a royalty check every month was for thirty-four thousand dollars. And George was on his way to becoming what people call a shillionaire. And when I when I invited George to my class the next year, along with Ralph Kisberg from the Responsible Drilling Alliance, to talk to my students about his experience with fracking, he decided to make his one and what he claimed would be his only trip to Williamsport, the 400 mile round trip in a stretch limousine. Now, few leaseholders I met made as much money as George did, but they all reaped something, those who leased their land. So, you know, I call this, I call this the fracking lottery and it's a lottery in, it's, it's in the sense that um, it actually was not necessarily known who would make the most money in advance. Obviously, if you have more acres to lease, you can make more money, but the leasing is a one-time upfront bonus payment. And really for a lot of people, the life-changing money is if you continually are getting royalties every month, but it's not really known in advance who's gonna wind up being part of a unit of which they're drawing gas out of. You get a percentage of all the gas drawn out. And so it depends on the depth of the shell, the thickness of the shell, the proximity to a pipeline. And so some people who thought they'd make a lot of money didn't make a lot of money. Other people who didn't know what to expect wound up making, you know, making a lot of money. And the one thing I'd say as a sort of broader context, and this was my preconception going in, you know, the media tends to focus a lot on these communities where fracking is like tearing a town in half. You've got half of a community for it, half against it. And that's actually atypical. Uh, in greater Williamsport, most people lease their land. And we now know through more survey research that wasn't done when I had gone to Williamsport, but the closer you are to gas wells, the more likely you are to support them. And where fracking is actually occurring in the heartland, there's quite a bit of support for it. Um, and it's really, there, the opposition comes from urban areas and coastal areas uh, to such an extent that uh, sociologist Feder Adoption, who writes about this says, it's more, uh, it's more a not in your backyard phenomenon than a not in my backyard phenomenon, right? You have a lot of people who don't live over the shale who are in more densely populated urban areas, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, for instance, in Pennsylvania who are opposed to shale. And then if you do surveys in the counties where there's a lot of drilling happening, it's not that people don't have concerns, but they're far more likely to support it. So as a lot of you probably know, fracking is one of today's most consequential and contentious land uses. And energy analysts have noted the frenetic pace and vast scale of the fracking boom has transformed geopolitics and the world economy. A decade ago, we were worried about peak oil. And now we're, we've got a glut of oil so much so that uh, granted it was because of coronavirus partly, but oil briefly was below $0 a barrel, as you may recall, about eight months ago. Um, but this sort of big picture overlooks how personal fracking is. The energy revolution is not a decision made at the, you know, at the most basic level of to frack or not to frack. It's not a decision made by a country, a state, or companies. It's a decision made by thousands of individuals who make a decision like George to lease or to not lease their land. And so it's a series of individual choices rather than the result of collective deliberation. Granted, you have some states like New York where the governor has banned fracking, uh, but, but few of the states that have banned fracking are over the major shale deposits. And in the states that, have, you know, that fracking has occurred, there has been no, there's not a collective decision. There's no vote on whether they're gonna allow fracking or not. There's no vote allowed in Pennsylvania on the township level of whether a township is going to allow drilling or not. The votes are a series of individuals who decide whether to lease their mineral rights or not, the gas companies. And this speaks to the unique structure of American property law. America is the only country in the world where the majority of mineral rights are privately held. In most places, the government owns all or the majority of the mineral rights. And this is where the, the uh, name of the title of my book comes from. Embedded in American common law is a phrase, whoever owns the soil, it is theirs up to heaven and down to hell. Now, of course, air, air travel restricted air rights, but mineral rights have not been restricted unless one's deed has been severed. Um, but, but otherwise, uh, every individual who owns a piece of land owns it all the way down to the mantle. And so that's why this decision of what's going to happen with these minerals is not made by one large entity or a government acting in the public interest. It's made by whoever sits atop that, that little slice of shale. And so this ostensibly private decision because we have such strong property rights and it's up to the individual what they wanna do with their land um, has public consequences, of course. Um, and there's two major levels. And uh, you know, obviously there's the planetary consequences. 
So when you burn natural gas, yes, it burns cleaner than oil or coal, but it still burns carbon. And natural gas itself, methane, is a, is a greenhouse gas that on a 20 year cycle is 80 times more potent than carbon. And so methane released into the atmosphere uh, is, is, a major, is a major greenhouse gas uh, problem in and of itself. And of course, on the other level at which this private decision has public consequences is on the local level. Um, it impacts neighbors' air, water, property, their experience of what people refer to as rural character. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll try to share here for a moment. Um, so up top, you will see this is, the, this is George's backyard. So that is what that those are the six gas wells that are hooked up to uh, the six gas processing units. What they do is when the gas comes out of the ground, they remove any impurities that are in it. So the few liquid hydrocarbons that are in there, remove the sand, burn off the water, and then it is pipeline ready. And so that is what sits in George's backyard. Uh, on, on your bottom right, you will see an aerial view that I took from an airplane. That's a typical setup. So that huge green rectangle there is a water impoundment pond that stores water to frack one well one time, takes up to 5 million gallons of water. Uh, that can hold fresh water or it may hold uh, wastewater that's come back out, although that's less, that's not happening as much today as it used to. And then at the bottom of that picture, that same picture, you see the square where the actual well pad is. Um, then, you know, another, these, and this is just the taste, but um, you'll also have flaring. So often after a well has, has they fracked the well and the gas is coming back up, it's not hooked up to the pipeline yet. And so they have to burn off the gas because it's coming out at very high pressure. I hope you can hear this. Can you hear it? louder than a bed, and uh, it can go on for days, and as you can see this house here, it's about 200 feet, it's about 200 feet, and that house is not actually the property which the gas well is on, so they didn't choose for that to happen, they live right next to that, right, um, and so, um, it has, it has a lot of these, you know, these visceral immediate impacts that impact what people call the rural character, uh, of an area. So, uh, so um, stepping back for a second, one of the main themes that I'm going to talk about, that I talk about in the book, is a broader theme throughout American politics. A recurring dilemma that I would argue is at the core of American politics that plays out through fracking is how we balance individual freedom and the commonwealth. Um, you know, you hear this, so for instance, the right to bear arms versus whether that right to bear arms ought to include assault rifles, which can kill, you know, dozens of people. Uh, obviously, you see this playing out with coronavirus, the right, the right of the individual to not wear a mask or the right of individuals to gather closely uh, in, you know, indoors balanced against the, the public good, right? Whether, that, you know, whether you exercising that right harms other people. And this has been a constant political struggle, not just in America, but I would argue it's at the core of American politics. It explains a lot of our partisan divides, you know, favoring individualism versus favoring the commonwealth. And this is at the core of, of the politics around fracking. Um, and I don't just mean, I don't mean even politics between just among uh, opponents and proponents, even among proponents of fracking in Greater Williamsport. So almost every resident that I met who leased their land felt that they ought to be able to do whatever they want on their own property. So on this principle, private leasing is nobody else's business, right? It's my land, I do what I want. However, they also believe that others were equally entitled to that same right and in being a responsible community member. So on those grounds, neighbors' interests ought to warrant consideration in one's decision to lease because private leasing will impact their neighbors, right? And so this, this tension between, between individualism and, and the public good is also at the core of most environmental problems, which, which, which environmentalists and, you know, and people who study this refer to as resource dilemmas, right? A resource dilemma most basically arises when the pursuit of your self-interest results in the degradation of a shared resource, which harms everyone, including yourself in the long run. I mean, you can think of tons of examples. One of the most well-known in the United States is cod fishing. So codfish up through the 80s were so numerous on, on the, in the Northeastern coast of America and Canada that there was almost no restrictions on fishing. And then, but the, the advent of, of mechanized trawlers, which can just put a net all the way down and scrape the bottom of the ocean and refrigerated units so that they can keep fishing and never have to come back to shore, decimated the cod population in, in such short order that within 
10 to 15 years, almost all the cod were gone, tens of thousands of jobs, the entire industry collapsed, people lost their jobs. And so that short term interest of every individual to capture as many cod as possible resulted in the long run in the destruction of this entire industry and this entire ecosystem, right? But so for a lot of us though, resource dilemmas are usually experienced in the abstract, right? We might buy carbon offsets because we have some vague sense that flying in a plane might harm somebody somewhere, uh, lead to climate refugees, make it harder for future generations to have a habitable planet. But most of us don't actually meet the people who are directly harmed by our involvement in a resource dilemma, right? So few of us are forced to reckon with the public impacts of our carbon intensive lifestyles. We don't meet the climate refugees. We don't meet the future generations that can't guzzle gasoline the way that we do, that can't use electricity the way that we do. But shale communities like Greater Williamsport are in the unenviable position of having to confront a resource dilemma face to face at the fence post, the general store, little league games, town hall meetings with their next door neighbors. So I follow the shale community in central Pennsylvania, Greater Williamsport for the past seven years. I lived there for a year and then I followed up to understand how residents who are living through a resource dilemma experience it and thought, think about it. So today um, I'm gonna talk about parts of the book, um, two of the main arguments that animate about two thirds of the chapters in the book. I can't talk about the whole thing. Um, so for instance, I won't talk about, but I'm happy to talk about in the Q and A, I won't talk about fracking on public land in Pennsylvania, which I wrote about. I won't talk a lot about uh, anti-fracking activism, although that is a major part of the book too. And we have two of the members of the Responsible Journal Alliance here, at least maybe some more who I came to know. Um, and so if you wanna talk about that, I would be happy to defer to them to talk about that as well. Um, but the two main arguments that I'm going to talk about are this. First one, against economistic presumptions, local support for fracking can't be reduced to the economic benefits that individual, individuals or communities get. So I don't buy the argument that it's because they make a lot of money is the main or the only reason that people support it. It's obviously a part of it. Um, but I wanna argue and convince you that partisan identities and notions about the proper role of government um, play as much, if not more of a role than whether you individually make money. Um, the other thing I wanna, I'm gonna argue is that the justification for land leasing is often couched in the language of individual liberty, my right to do what I want on my own property. Yet land sovereignty has the ironic effect of eroding other people's liberty. You exercising your property rights infringes other people's capacity to enjoy their own property rights. And I'm gonna conclude with some broader lessons from this case study for how we think about climate change and environmentalism more broadly. So as a bit of background, this may be quite familiar to some of you, um, I'll move through it quickly. It's estimated that there's enough methane trapped in layers of shale rock a mile or more beneath the surface of many parts of the United States, mostly in the heartland, to potentially supply US energy needs for decades while ostensibly lowering, lowering energy costs and perhaps creating jobs, manufacturing jobs, welding jobs, et cetera. There's also been this notion contested more lately, but heavily bought into even among Democrats up, up until a few years ago, I would argue, that natural gas is a bridge fuel to renewable energy. It burns cleaner than coal or oil. And so the idea is, yes, it's a fossil fuel, but if it's, it's helping phase out coal plants, then it's better for the environment. And it is true that part of the greenhouse reduction that have occurred in the United States in the past 10 years have been related to natural gas. Um, I'll talk more about why I'm still uh, not bought into the role that it can take us much further. Um, so very quickly, just to show you a, sh a slide if you are, if you are uh, totally uninitiated. Um, you know, for a long time, we've been drilling vertical wells. You drill straight down, you get a pocket of oil or gas, boom, it comes out. Um, shale gas and oil is further down. There's these strata of shale and individual molecules are locked in this rock. So if you just drill down and hit the shell layer vertically, you only get the tiny bit that's right where you drilled. It's like taking a core sample. Um, fracking allows to do this a bit better. Fracking is injecting at high pressure, millions of gallons of water mixed with other things like sand, which when, when you get cracks, the sand holds the cracks open, water makes the cracks go deeper. Um, Fracking has been a technology for several decades. You drop it, you push down this water at high pressure, it cracks open the rock further, the sand holds the cracks open. Um, there's also some chemicals in there, largely as anti-corrosive agents and lubricants. Um, but still, even if you frack, you can't get that much. The real innovation was combining fracking with horizontal drilling. You drill down to that shell layer and then you slowly arc as you approach the shell layer, then you drill horizontally through the shell layer. Now you're tapping the vein and they can drill for almost two miles horizontally. You drop, you drop explosive devices down there. 
that shoots ball bearings through the rock. So now the entire strata for up to two miles has cracks run through it. Now when you frack it, you're getting much more oil and gas. And so it's really that combination of hydraulic fracturing with directional drilling, which only really took off in the 2000s that you enable the fracking boom. Often when we talk about fracking, we're talking about this entire process, even though fracking is the one component of injecting at high pressure, the water and propants and chemicals. Um, but often we mean the whole thing. We mean the directional drilling as well. Um, so Pennsylvania, so the, the Marcella Shale is the largest shale deposit in the United States. It stretches from upstate New York down to West Virginia. As I mentioned, New York has a ban on fracking. So this puts Pennsylvania at the epicenter of the shale gas boom. Out in the Midwest, they're mostly drilling for oil with fracking. Um, they are, some are taking gas. A lot of them are just venting it, just wasting it to get to the oil. They're just releasing it in the atmosphere. And so Pennsylvania really became the epicenter of the shale gas boom. And Pennsylvania has been referred to several times, including an influential 2011 report as the Saudi Arabia of natural gas. Um, so to access the gas, energy firms need to lease the mineral rights from the owners. Uh, in Pennsylvania State Forest, that's the state. As I mentioned, Pennsylvania has leased hundreds of thousands of, of your state forests for drilling. Um, but the rest of it comes from individuals, people like George, who agree to lease their mineral rights. Uh, as I mentioned, they get a one-time leasing bonus paid up front for, and it's per acre. And then uh, you, and if you allow a pipeline to be put to your property, that's another one-time bonus payment. And then uh, the hope is that you get royalties. If they extract gas from underneath your property, then you get royalties every month based on how many acres you have in, in a unit. Um, and so of course, probably needless to say, fracking has generated a lot of controversy. Um, it was relatively, uh, flying under the radar as the boom took off until the movie, arguably until the movie Gasland, memorably featured flaming faucets and stories of contamination and brown water, government inaction. Um, and this led to the, the appearance of many anti-fracking groups, uh, helped birth the anti-fracking movement. Um, in Pennsylvania, there's over 300 confirmed cases of methane migrating in the drinking water in addition to other kinds of water contamination. It's really tough to know how many cases there really are. So DEP will not confirm a case unless there is a baseline water test. And in the beginning, it was not required that companies did a baseline water test. So individuals would have had to pay for that themselves. And so there's probably a lot more than that. We really don't know because the DEP won't issue a positive determination letter unless they have an independent baseline test prior to drilling, okay. um, which is standard now, but was a high bar in the beginning. So, to say a little bit more about what I did in 2013, quite a while ago now, uh, before my kids, I moved to Williamsport. I lived there for almost a year. And then I've spent the last seven years revisiting and keeping up with folks that are there. Um, I picked Williamsport for a few reasons. One, even though there were other counties that had more gas wells total, Williamsport had the most wells drilled the year before I moved there. So it was an area where it was really picking up. And so it was a place where I could go to see a lot of drilling happening. I also thought that Williamsport was interesting historically because in the late 1800s, it milled the most board feet of lumber in the world. And so it had this history of resource extraction. It was called the lumber capital of the world. Um, and also as small as Williamsport is, it's only about 28,000 residents, but it, be, it, was, it is the economic and administrative hub of fracking for the entire central and Northern tier of Pennsylvania. So all of the gas companies, Anadarko, Halliburton, whatever that were operating anywhere in Northern Pennsylvania, most of them put their headquarters around Williamsport. So it was really like this, this strategic place for me to go. Um, you might know Williamsport for the Little League World Series hosted for 10 days in South Williamsport every August. Um, but this sort of, this halcyon image elides the fact that it's a deindustrialized city. The county as a whole has experienced rural brain drain, uh, but in particular the city, its population was 45,000 in 1960, it's 28,000 today. Um, for, a, a, for a city of its size, it has a very outsized problem of heroin use, violent crime around drug issues. The poverty rate is twice as high as the rest of the state. Um, like Homing County, as soon as you step outside of Williamsport, it's incredibly rural and almost entirely white. There is a sizable black population in Williamsport itself. Um, it's quite conservative. Trump got over 70% of the vote in both 2016 and 2020. If you took out Williamsport and just focus on the rural area, it would probably be in the 90%. All of, all of Hillary's and all of Joe's support came from Williamsport itself, which is like this little liberal donut hole in this otherwise donut of, 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 of conservatism. Um, and so uh, 
I, so I uh, spent a lot of time talking to, um, as I mentioned, there's, 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 there's folks that I'm not going to talk as much today that were a major part of the study, like uh, the, 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 the responsible drilling alliance, but today I'm going to focus on the landowners, people who lease their land for drilling. Um, you know, basically what the two pictures on the right are, the kind of places I hung out to meet landowners. So the top one is Coex General Store, which is sort of an old fashioned general store where there's a soda pop stand and diner and they sell guns and groceries and appliances. And so the kind of place that, you know, people still from all around the rural areas would go to. The bottom right is a uh, place where, you know, a lot of people there uh, keep cows for either dairy or meat. And so I, I hung out a lot at a simple brick garage where people, farmers who had killed their steer would bring them to be quartered. And that's where I met uh, people like uh, Ann Nordell, you see on the bottom left, uh, you know, who's, who's a farmer hanging out in a place like this. Also, Ann, Ann actually sells at the Williamsport Growers Market. Um, and so, so you can encounter her there. But this is, this is how I came to know a lot of people who lease their land. Um, I mean, I should say a lot of them were, a lot of them were uh, working class farmers, custodian truck drivers, but as I mentioned, most people lease their land. So I met plenty of people who leased their land who were not poor, who were not working class, um, including professors, including professionals, including millionaires even. Um, and so it wasn't just the economically desperate who leased their land. Uh, and as I mentioned, this is who I'm gonna talk about today, but in the book, I also, uh, I spent a lot of time in state forests. And so I write about drilling in state forests. I spent a lot of time with the Responsible Drilling Alliance. Um, and so I dedicate some chapters to talking about those who are fighting fracking in Pennsylvania. So now let's to get to the heart of uh, what I wanna talk about. Um, the first thing I wanna convince you of is that partisan identities, especially identifying as conservative, if not libertarian, and social commitments, people's sense of duty to their community played a complementary role in enabling support for fracking and justifying individuals perceived right to benefit from leasing. So to return to George, George who, who identified to me as libertarian firmly believed that he had the God-given right to total autonomy over how he used his land, and even a sense of duty to realize its productive potential. That his father farmed it, he doesn't farm it, but what he can do is lease it, and that, and that therefore the land is still being productive, right? And when I asked him whether he thought the DEP, municipal authorities, or the community should have any say in his decision to lease his land, since that decision impacted the Commonwealth, he replied simply, nope. I prodded him to go a bit further, and he curtly added, it's my land, I'll do as I damn well please. And in turn, George believed it was none of his business or the government's business what anybody else did on their property either. He bristled at any form of government intrusion onto his land to the point that even when the gas company was putting in the, the gas wells, they were required by law to put safety signs in the front of his driveway that said, for instance, slow truck traffic, you know, these kinds of things. The signs were disgusting and he called his local representative trying to get the signs down because he felt like that was such an infringement on his property. Um, so this, this moral elevation of individual sovereignty, property rights, and self-reliance is often what residents had in mind when they talked about how fracking dovetailed with what they called rural values, right? So like this idea, what, when people talked about rural values, they often were talking about individual sovereignty, property rights, and self-reliance. And these beliefs, I, I, came to, I came to believe, support, a sustained support for fracking and antipathy for government intervention, even when people experience environmental harms and even when people don't make money from fracking. Um, and I'll give, you, I'll give you an example. Uh, I, I, came to know, I came to know Doyle and Peggy Bodle, who, uh, and, and when I met them, this is what their water looked like. So it had been laced with methane and also turned brown. So these are the dishes after they had been run through the dishwasher. Uh, and that's the water, the water, the humidifier, uh, the water that they were putting in the humidifier, right? And the Department of Environmental Protection did an investigation and, and affirmed that this was due to a natural gas well that had been drilled on their neighbor's property. Um, and so don't get me wrong, the Bulls were pissed about what happened and they and their neighbors were engaged in a lawsuit trying to sue the gas company. But so while they were angry at gas companies for harming their water, they nonetheless joined other lessers in emphasizing, as Doyle put it, that no one held a gun to my head to lease their land. Their support of individual choice even entailed embracing the role of acting as their own actuary rather than relying on the government or some other expert to assess the level of risk that they should be able to be willing to take on. So to dive, dive a bit deeper, Peggy, who was a retired uh, employee from the local Pop-Tarts factory, acknowledged that they knew before they leased the property that allowing gas drilling so close to their home entailed risk. 
she also knew that they never stood to get rich to get rich because they only owned two acres. So even if they got royalties off of those two acres, it wouldn't have been more than $100, $150 a month. But in rationalizing their decision to lease anyway, Peggy compared fracking to everyday risks that people accept in exchange for convenience. This is a quote. Everything at one point in time, they put stuff on it, like formaldehyde when we were growing up and we ate that. And you could get lung cancer and have never smoked a cigarette in your life. Her husband Doyle interjected, I agree with her. With all the chemicals we're putting on crops today, you can't tell me we know it's 100% safe. Drawing a parallel to fracking, he, he added, it doesn't matter where you live, you're gonna have water problems of some kind if you have private well water, which by the way, an estimated 3 million Pennsylvanians have. Um, so the Bodles and four of their neighbors had contaminated water from this one gas well, and they were, but nonetheless, they refused to conclude from their experience that greater oversight of fracking was needed. Um, none of them thought that they that none of them thought that there should be greater regulations and restrictions on fracking. Their inclination to distrust government agencies, including the DEP, might have made taking an anti-fracking position unappealing or even untenable, I think, because they understood that the implied solution to managing this risk, government intervention, and increased regulations of private land use was inconsistent with their belief in self-determination and property rights. Indeed, the Bodles and their neighbors were adamant that it wasn't their place to say or do anything that might compromise their neighbor's land sovereignty. So even though they had suffered, they were worried that if they made a big stink that, and that led to more restrictions on fracking that their neighbors would suffer, right? And so they were concerned about that as well. So this leads into what I think is perhaps a bit more of a surprising point. Um, this, in complementing their appeals to individualism, Residents also explain their support for fracking in light of their relations with and their obligations to the community, to their neighbors. So for instance, it was widely known that most residents supported fracking and most people believe that the community as a whole benefited from the industry, even if they personally did not. And at the same time, it was widely believed whether or not it was true that so-called fractivists, anti-drilling activists were predominantly urban liberals who as state representative Garth Everett remarked to me quote, have no clue about rural values. And I'll just give you one example that really stuck in a number of people's minds. Um, in 2012, there was a, uh, a, a trailer park outside of Williamsport called Riverdale Trailer Homes that uh, the owner of the property that the trailers were on had sold the land to a company that was going to withdraw water to be used in fracking. So all the, all the owner, the residents were going to be evicted. And so um, this this led to some outcry and a bunch of the nascent anti-fracking movement activists, including people who were veterans of Occupy Wall Street and other, you know, and other po political movements from New York City and Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, descended onto uh, Riverdale Trailer Park, which, and it became known as Occupy Riverdale. And this really stuck with people like the Bodles and their neighbors, Tom and Mary Crawley. When I talked to Tom and Mary over a year after Occupy Riverdale, they cited it as the main reason why they refused to talk about their situation to the media at all. Um, Tom worried, as he put it, that environmentalists from outside the community who heard about the contamination issue would demonize their nice old neighbor whose property hosted the gas well or otherwise disrupt the community. Mary worried, oh gosh, no picket lines. And Tom added, we're afraid everybody's gonna blame our neighbors. It's not their fault that the well contaminated us, but these people, meaning the environmentalists, have no interest in the area and they're just gonna come in here and create a stink. So in light of this, supporting fracking, even if you personally didn't benefit, was viewed, was viewed perhaps ironically as a way of showing solidarity with your community uh, against perceived outsiders to the community, AKA anti-fracking activists. I should note that another incident that happened that people talked about um, dismissively was uh, Yoko Ono and Sean Lennon and some anti-fracking activists from New York City drove a bus through central Pennsylvania and stopped at some, some sites where, uh, where violations had occurred. And this was also talked about like that they didn't want Yoko Ono showing up like with her bus, you know? Um, okay, so now I'm gonna get to the second main point that I wanna get across to you. So Lessers invoked what John Locke would call their natural right to land sovereignty but this had the ironic effect when, of leasing one's land. The ironic effect is that eroded others' freedom over their estate and their right to be left alone. Um, I realized I meant to stop sharing. I was sharing the whole time, but that's all right, because now I, now I don't have to share again to get to the next one. Um, so this is Scott and Betty McLean. Scott had, by the time I met him, Scott had owned this ranch house on five acres on the side of a mountain in a very rural part of Lycoming County. 
uh, for decades. And but his second wife Betty had just moved in the year before, and uh, Scott fancied himself a mountain man. He would wrangle snakes. He went on survivalist hikes in extreme cold, surviving off of deer and beaver that he would kill. Um, and in his mind, you know, he was one of these folks prone to conspiracy theories. In his mind, most social institutions were crooked. Corporations, the government agencies charged with regulating them, the police, non-governmental organizations, his township supervisors, etc. The kind of broad takeaway that I took from his constant cynicism of corruption, no matter who the party was, was that he had this Rousseauian outlook. Civilization corrupts, living an isolated self-reliant existence close to nature was noble and liberating. I thought it was revealing that Scott and other rural residents that I came to know still talked of their properties as homesteads. Bundled into this conception of a homestead is the idea that one's humble parcel is their dominion. Private property was the font from which Scott's sense of autonomy flowed. Like Thomas Jefferson, he believed that homesteads were citizens' best defense against government overreach and the debasing influences of the city. Scott had no qualms about intercepting trespassers with a holstered gun. And he spit on the idea that this huge berm he had built on his property to control the flow of water down the mountain was illegal because he didn't get a permit. The state has no authority, he bellowed. On his land, he was king. Now, the landowners like Scott that I met didn't bother justifying their politics by quoting ideologists like John Stuart Mill, but in practice, they tacitly abided the liberalist social contract, live and let live. When it came to leasing their mineral rights, few if anyone thought that others should have any say in that decision. The very idea of needing somebody else's consent to improve the use value of your land or of being required to share the spoils generated by property ownership, meaning the royalties that you get from doing it, was almost unthinkable, if not immoral, because it entailed a restriction on personal and economic freedom. But even John Locke, who conceptualized land sovereignty as a so-called natural right, recognized that there were limits to an individual's right to enjoy their property. What became known as the Lockean Proviso is the idea that your right to property is only clear and exclusive so long as it doesn't jeopardize somebody else's ability to enjoy their property. I mean, if you think about this, there's so many ways that American property law sanctions the Lockean Proviso. Zoning ordinances, building permits, restricted covenants, easements. These all place restrictions on individual land sovereignty. And in general, the idea of these restrictions, the rationale is that other people's position, their capacity to enjoy public goods or their own property ought not be worsened by your land use decision, right? So when it comes to fracking, private land leasing routinely as a matter of course violated the Lockean Proviso. In almost every instance, it created spillover effects that worsened the well-being of others in the community and infringed on their freedom to benefit from their own property. And we can, just ask, we can just ask Scott and Betty McLean about that. Um, Scott, I'll, I'll share with you a uh, Facebook page that he created, whoops, to document what had happened to his land. Um, so what, what you see here is a big rig truck driving up his driveway a mere two feet from his house. And what happened here is that Scott did lease his land for drilling. Uh, but, and these trucks are en route to a hunting camp, a seasonal hunting camp on the top of the mountain. So before fracking was occurring, Scott had actually, Scott had granted an easement to poor shot hunting camp because they had a hard time accessing their camp on top of the mountain. They had to go all the way around the other side. So they had asked Scott in the early 2000s if he would grant an easement that would allow them to use his driveway and have them build a driveway past it to go up to their hunting camp. And Scott granted that easement. He, he considered it to be the neighborly thing to do. And he wanted it official in case he ever sold the property so that the future owner would have to let Poor Shot Hunting Camp um, use it. But now drilling comes along. Scott supported drilling, fracking in the beginning. He leased his land. But what he didn't really think about was what would happen when the drilling, when Poor Shot Hunting Camp leased their 1,000 acres and the gas company asked if they could use the driveway, that Poor Shot would say yes. And so all of a sudden it meant hundreds of big rig trucks driving up Scott's driveway a mere two feet from his house, shook the foundation, cracked the foundation of his house, his chimney crumbled, uh, and Scott had no ability to stop this from happening because legally, legally the easement had been granted to the driveway. And so Scott had to deal with all of these spillover effects and eventually he moved out. He gave up on the property uh, because it was incessant and he, had fi he fixed the foundation several times. He fixed the 
the, um, the chimney and it still kept happening, right? Scott had tried all kinds of things, including a driveway protest where him and his wife uh, sat out with, you know, sat out um, in lawn chairs on the driveway to try to prevent the truck. Scott with a holstered gun on his waist, that led to him being arrested and Scott not being allowed to show his firearm on that side of his property while the trucks are going up and down. It's our driveway, Scott fumed, and Betty complained that the neighbors were endangering their property and their livelihoods, but there was nothing they could do about it. And these were the kinds of spillover effects that people often absorb. I think we think of contaminated water and that happens, but there's all these other effects. Um, I mean, again, it, it can take a thousand trucks to, to bring the water to frack one well, and they go up and down these small roads. Uh, people's residents sometimes get no notices in their mailbox that you can't use your driveway for seven hours today because they're gonna be moving these trucks in and out. Right? There's all these other sorts of ways that people absorb the spillover effects. Um, and so Scott moved and uh, I met some other folks who, who at the time I think I encountered them were seriously considering moving as well. Um, and this is Tom and Mary Crawley. And let me, let me make sure I'm sharing that. Okay, great. Uh, what you see them sitting here behind them is a gas vent. So they are the Bowles neighbors who I've already talked about. They wound up with explosive levels of methane in the drinking water. So this is a vent that is supposed to vent as much of the natural gas as possible out of their water before it goes into their house so that there are not explosive levels of methane in their house. Um, of course, they still won't drink the water and they have multiple gas detectors throughout their house uh, you know, to, to, to see if it gets to those levels. Um, and as I said, when I, by the time I met them, it had already been two years since they stopped drinking their tap water. After a natural gas well was drilled up the hill about 2,100 feet from their home, the spigot hissed and the water, which became as cloudy as a cup of skim milk, fizzed like soda. Um, this is the water coming out of their And we never had that before. No, that's just it. So as I mentioned, uh, uh, the gas company was issued a violation for defective cement casing, which allowed the gas to escape um, into people's drinking water. The DEP cited the gas company for this, but that didn't leave the Crawleys with much to do. Um, at the time, the gas company was denying responsibility. Tom and Mary had their life's money invested in this property, which they couldn't sell. Um, who would want to buy it with that going on? And so they felt that they were stuck. So what Tom and Mary, and again, Tom and Mary did lease their own property and supported drilling. What they couldn't anticipate, let alone control, was the extent to which their neighbor's private land use decision to lease their property exposed Tom and Mary involuntarily to harm. And I should mention, this would have happened to Tom and Mary whether they leased their land or not, right? So the fact that they leased their own property actually isn't, didn't heighten the risk um, that they were exposed to here. And so these are extreme cases. Um, you know, most people don't wind up with contaminated water, but there are thousands of mundane ways that land leasing infringes on others' sovereignty. Restricted driveway access, view sheds, roads that get pulverized by the trucks, noise, and the loss of the night sky. Um, and I'll just show you a couple pictures that just give a taste of some of the other um, examples. Um, so here you see at the top, neighbors looking at flaring happening next door. The picture with the cat in it, that's a drilling rig that a neighbor looks at when, you know, is looking at when they're on their deck. Uh, you see the trucks, those are trucks lining up at a water withdrawal site, these kind of truck caravans that are on these small roads. And then um, the other image of the orange sky, that's actually at night, but that's all the orange, the, how much it's lit up from, um, from, fl from uh, flaring. And, uh, you know, one participant I met called this fracker borealis, um, this, this eerie effect of dusk created by by the light pollution. As I watched, um, as I watched residents like the Crawleys involuntarily absorb the spillover effects of neighbors ostensibly private land use decisions, a deep irony became apparent to me. The legally protected freedom to exploit your mineral rights erodes the freedom of others, their right to be left alone and their sovereignty over their own estate. Now, behavioral scientists have written, have endlessly analyzed resource dilemmas using anodyne, lang anodyne language of game theory. They talk about defectors and free riders. But what I don't think people talk as much about with, with resource dilemmas of which fracking is just one kind is the way that resource dilemmas can threaten civil liberty. So this 
live and let live social contract that arguably traditionally governs community relations in, in places like Appalachia, especially in conservative places, is a staple of American political discourse. It's not unique, to, it's not entirely unique to the most conservative parts of the country. This liberalist maxim is grounded in the premise, however, that there is a domain of private life that is distinct and separate from the public sphere. So if you think about your, your rights to freedom of expression, um, you're granted the liberty to love who you want to love, worship where you want to worship, express yourselves how you want to express yourselves. Why? Because these are considered private actions that do not trespass upon other people's ability to express themselves, right? So the whole basis by which you are, you are granted freedom of expression is because that doesn't infringe on other people's capacity to express themselves however they see fit, right? So it does not undermine the public interest. But as historian Naomi Oreskes notes, macro environmental problems erase this barrier between public and private life. Seemingly innocent and inconsequential individual actions, for instance, eating meat, driving a car, that traditionally would have been construed as purely private decisions not to be regulated because they don't impact the public domain are amplified by technology and indefinite iterations such that they infiltrate the public sphere in the form of greenhouse gases or other pollutants. And when they do, they harm the public good good by contributing to global plights like species extinction and climate change. I call this and I developed this idea in my book, the public private paradox. The private is public in the, in the aggregate, our personal lifestyle choices trespass on other people's sovereignty in ways that are akin to how the spillover effects of the Crawley's neighbor's decision at least impacted the Crawley's ability to enjoy their property. It's just harder for me or you to trace the connections around the globe of our lifestyle decisions than it is for the Crawley's to trace them down the road right, to their neighbor. And so in this epoch of climate change, personal liberty increasingly becomes a zero sum game. My game is your loss. So to start wrapping up, when it, I should say that when it came to matters in the greater Williamsport area that were thought to be in the public interest, many locals did endorse civic association. So even George, who was a relative recluse, he was an elected member of the Montoursville school board and he was part of a passionate, though ultimately a losing battle to prevent the historic high school from being torn down. Why do I bring this up? Because I was struck by how dozens of residents in tiny outlying municipalities, many of which only had a few hundred taxpayers, regularly would cram into monthly board of supervisor meetings to discuss and vote on and have an influence on incredibly mundane topics, whether to add a stoplight at a busy intersection, whether to use a certain amount of the municipality's funding to replace a damaged guardrail, or whether to allow trucks to park in a vacant lot. But mineral rights, perhaps the ultimate expression of personal land sovereignty, fostered the illusion that deciding whether to develop your subsurface estate is a purely private matter, not a public <laughs> matter that is a part of the community. And so this belief is bolstered by the fact that most landowners could and did lease their mineral rights with the stroke of a pen at the kitchen table without any <laughs> of their neighbors or other members of the community present. There was no <laughs> referenda or town hall debates about whether the community should allow land leasing, even though other issues that impact the Commonwealth were debated and decided in town hall meetings. To place, whether or not to place a cell phone tower on one's yard, whether or not a new business would be allowed to get a liquor license required more public input than whether one could lease their own land for drilling. Now, some of you may know why this is the case, and it's actually distinct to fracking. Um, you know, in 2012, the Republican legislature and governor pushed through so-called Act 13, which enabled the state to preempt local municipalities' ability to control fracking through zoning. So zoning is the biggest way that municipalities control land uses, right? You, de you might designate an area rural, which means that industrial development is not allowed. And what state preemption did was it said as long as a gas well is within a certain amount of distance from the nearest residence or water well um, and other sorts of restrict, you know, restrictions that were not very restrictive, to be honest, uh, then gas drilling had to be allowed in all zones, residential, agricultural, you name it, right? So fracking is a uniquely invasive industry. Um, and preempt preemption enraged many local residents who turned up at Board of Supervisor meetings because many of them endorsed or took for granted that this was a venue where they could voice concern over proposed land uses and be a part of deliberating about decisions that impacted the common good. Locals treasured their capacity to decide these matters for themselves and took that responsibility seriously. Now, I, should, I need to note a few caveats. When, whenever, a whenever a gas well is going to be drilled, there is a permit hearing, 
So there is a public permit hearing. So there's no hearing for leasing. Now, so that sounds like, okay, so there's a public permit hearing and individuals can come and they can express what their concerns are. I mean, I'm concerned that this is gonna affect my water. I'm concerned that all these trucks are dangerous on the road. However, what Act 13 meant was that municipalities, while there were permit hearings, basically the Board of Supervisors could only rubber stamp the permit. The Board of Supervisors had to demonstrate irreparable damage to the health and safety of the community. It was an incredibly high bar and the few times that any municipality attempted it, they were sued. Um, and so basically you almost never saw any instance in which municipalities would, would, would uh, overturn a permit, would not allow a permit to go through. And when I spoke to Board of Supervisor uh, members, most of them were adamant that they didn't really have a choice but to allow the permit to go through. Um, and some of them feared that they would be, that the, the township would be sued into bankruptcy um, if they were to you know, deny a permit. So for Alexis de Tocqueville who wrote Democracy in America, observations on what fueled democracy in America all, over 200 years ago, um, this idea, this notion of home rule, local control, local decision-making is what made American democracy distinct and robust. Um, for political economist, Eleanor Ostrom, home rule was a mechanism for mitigating resource dilemmas. If we, if we create conditions, she argued, that foster trust, accountability, and egalitarian decision-making at the local level, Ostrom believed that a kind of civic environmentalism would take root in communities regardless of their political leaning. Locals would come to view restraints on land use as legitimate, she argued, because they're adapted to conditions on the ground and because they are constru they're constructed by the very people who use a resource and are impacted by their use. So local in home rule, locals craft the rules that they abide by rather than them being designed or enforced by bureaucrats in a faraway capital. Um, I should note, if you, if you, you, might, you may sense the irony that home rule, home rule was struck down in Pennsylvania, in Colorado, in Texas by Republican legislatures and Republican governors, even though home rule is ostensibly a conservative principle, right? Um, and, and so there, I think there's an irony there that, that, that if you were to ask somebody who is more likely to support rather than top-down decision-making and regulation bottom up, people would say conservatives are. Um, but home rule was struck down or preempted in almost every major state where drilling happens um, by conservative legislatures and conservative governors. Um, and so to me, the extent to which board of supervisor meetings that I attended um, and the mechanisms of municipal zoning in particular conformed to Ostrom's design principles for governing commons sustainably and equitably is striking. If we take a more expansive view of commons, so as not just to mean resources like air and water, but to include uh, quality of life, tranquility, night sky, view sheds, it becomes apparent that zoning ordinances are effectively communal agreements to restrict private property rights in order to conserve a finite shared resource, for instance, rural character, right? And that many individuals, even in conservative, in conservative communities, support zoning regulations, um, even though their own property rights may be infringed, right? Um, it's part of what can sustain the character of a community. So board of supervisor meetings and public hearings are venues where locals can deliberate on a case-by-case -case basis whether particular private land uses are compatible with the needs of the community. And if not, they can petition the board of supervisors to reject them. Now, I should note one important thing that a, a fair number of you already know and are, want, can't believe I didn't say it already. Um, Act 13 was struck down. The central provision was struck down that disallowed municipalities to... In, 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 to uh, create, you know, to create their own restrictions on fracking. However, well, that would seem to allow home rule when several townships try to ban injection wells, which are, they drill wells and dump wastewater in them. The Department of Environmental Protection sued them. And they sued them saying that there was no constitutional right to self-rule on these issues. And so the DEP still maintains that regulations are a state issue. And, and so that municipalities cannot ban fracking or, regul or, or greatly regulate at the local level. Um, and so, yeah, so, you know, I don't, I admit, I don't have any grand solution to some of the problems I've, I've laid out. I mean, I do believe that if we talk on a large scale about ameliorating and stopping climate change, I do believe that the kinds of structural transformations that progressives are talking about are required uh, to stall climate change, AKA leaving fossil fuels in the ground. Um, but I also know that that kind of government intervention is not gonna fly with a lot of the folks that I met and many of the folks that live above shale deposits in the heartland. 
So I think that if environmentalists ever hope to get Heartland residents on board with their missions, and, and if they wish to not be dismissed themselves as urban, liberal, coastal elites, whatever, throw in your epithet, um, they need to move beyond the near singular focus on federal regulation and to a lesser extent, even state regulation. Um, now, I mean, an interesting fact, the more poorer, the more poor and the more rural a county or state is, the more likely it is to suffer from pollution. So you'd think that these most polluted places, these poorest places would be ripe for a message of an environmentalist. These are also the reddest places in the United States of America. So the most polluted places in the country, accepting you know, parts of cities, the poorest parts of cities, but if you look on the county or state level, the, the, the most polluted counties and the most polluted states are also the places that have most rejected environmental regulation. Um, and so um, I think that, and why do they reject environmental regulation? It's often viewed as government overreach. There's what I focus on here, the emphasis on property rights and a fear that government regulation infringes on property rights. There's also of course, fear of further economic decline that more regulations take away jobs. Um, I think there's room to get residents on board with some environmentalist goals, but only if activists listen to the concerns of middle America and emphasize policies that at least that, at least that are harmonized or at least are not in blatant uh, conflict with so-called rural values, especially land sovereignty and local control, um, collective decision-making at the community level. The idea here, as I mentioned with Ostrom, is that people are more inclined to play the game if they help make the rules. I mean, just to give you one for instance as well, and we see the same thing across a variety of issues. Surveys that ask people in Pennsylvania and elsewhere about specific policies. So do you support gas companies being required to pipe water on temporary pipelines on the sides of roads instead of putting trucks on the road? Do you support greater setbacks of a gas well from a drinking well? A lot of people support these individual policies but when you ask them, do you support greater regulations on fracking, they say no, right? There's also been study, a, a, a study in Colorado found that conservatives are, if you ask them about policies that exist, they're more likely to think to exaggerate the regulations on fracking in Colorado. So there's a, there's a notion that regulations are much more restrictive than they actually are. But then if in, when conservatives in Colorado were asked about specific policies that actually are laws that progressives wanna enact, a lot of conservatives supported the individual policies, right? We saw a similar thing with Obamacare. You call it Obamacare and conservatives didn't like it in surveys. If you ask them about, uh, you know, if you ask them about the policy without calling it that, or if you ask about specific things like pre-existing conditions, people support that, right? Um, and so there's some way, I, I realize this isn't easy, but to, to, to not, the emphasis on top-down regulation is the alienating thing for, for, for a, lot of, a lot of folks that I came to know anyway. And so I also think it's interesting, by the way, that, um, and again, I'm not in the illusion that local control is going to solve. It's certainly the biggest things like climate change. But what I will note is that in every instance in Colorado, Texas, uh, you know, uh, Pennsylvania, where communities have attempted to exert local control over fracking, and in a lot of these cases, they've actually been, the state has told them it's illegal. But there's been a lot of communities that have tried. And in every community that I know of that tried to do this, they all pushed for greater restrictions. None of them pushed for less restrictions than the state had. And that's even in very conservative areas, right? And so it's to say that there does appear to be evidence that even in conservative areas, if there was more municipal level control granted, many conservative communities would want more regulations than there currently are. So to, 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 to finish up here, in my view, Americans pri America's privileging of personal sovereignty and property rights sanctions the usurping of the commons. On the local level, this can be through groundwater, roads, peace and quiet, night sky, globally, of course, the atmosphere. Um, but politically, I also think it undermines the social contract. Um, you know, the public-private paradox means that it's almost impossible for us to live the way we want and not impact other people's ability to live the way they would like to live, right? Your, your capacity to lease inherently affects other people's ability to enjoy public goods and their own property. Um, your, your decision to not wear a mask and to hold large gatherings indoors has these public consequences. And I would argue infringes on the social contract, right? Because you are actually, in some cases, literally killing other people, right? When it comes to COVID-19. 
So the last thing I would say is it's facile to frame the resource dilemma associated with leasing in America as unavoidable, that this was just going to happen no matter what. And certainly, I think it's facile to, to paint people who lease their land as the bad guys. This situation is the result of a unique legal and political structure in America that does th at least three things. The first thing, it constitutionally enshrines and grants preeminence to private subsurface mineral ownership. What this does is this puts the onus of underground mining decisions on individual property owners, rather than institutions, rather than the public in a referendum vote, rather than Congress, rather than the state or the federal government. It puts it on individual property owners. Second thing that this legal political structure does, it doesn't account for the fact that most of the externalities that neighbors in the planet must absorb from oil and gas activity on leased land, right? This, this isn't taken into account, these spillover effects. And the third thing, it strips communities of their traditional autonomy to ensure that private property rights don't jeopardize the commonwealth. And so it's within this system that makes it so hard for landowners like most of us to avoid the public-private paradox. So very last thing I'll say here is I do entertain some hope that perhaps if more of us recognize that the externalities produced by private land use and private energy use decisions actually are, can wind up violating other people's human rights, perhaps more people would push for green energy policies that rein in these externalities in the name of other core American principles aside from individual sovereignty, namely fairness and democracy. After all, the idea that everyone deserves the same freedoms and that every community stakeholder should have a say in decisions that affect them is as American as a little league baseball. And so with that, I'm happy to take whatever questions. Well, oh, and thank you so much. I think if we weren't on Zoom, you'd hear lots of clapping and that was a wonderful, really wonderful talk. Um, and I learned so much from it and I'm sure everyone else did. It was formative and interesting. So we have some time for questions and um, Pam Costi, who is co-chair of um, our environmental justice team at MLUC, is gonna read the questions in the chat and uh, Colin has an opportunity to answer them. Great, well, there are just a few right now that I saw. Um, so I'll, I'll take a look at them. Peggy Schmidt, uh, or Peg Schmidt, do the people in Williamsport worry about how fracking impacts their property values? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, um, I'm not gonna say that nobody did. Um, and again, certainly I think for instance, uh, uh, folks, some folks that are on this call, if they wanted to, uh, that, are, that are more against, you know, that were uh, some of the community members against fracking, like Barb could chime in here. There were people that, that did, but I think um, it's, at least of the landowners I met, there was a lot more concern over the amount of money you could make from this. And there also is the, you know, a lot of them didn't wor worry so much about property values, I think, because the idea of selling your property was not on their mind. So for instance, Tom and Mary Crawley, why they cared about selling their property was because it had been contaminated. They lived on a sliver of what was his great grandfather's 4,000 acre farm, which is a common story here, right? A lot of landowners are third, fourth, fifth generation occupying a piece of what was a large family estate. And so many people saw themselves as a, as a placeholder of this property that would continue to be passed on. Um, so to, if, to the extent that there was worry, there was more worry about how it might impact the next generation's capacity or desire to hold onto the land. But what's interesting there is it's ambivalent too, because for instance, George, George was really worried that his adopted daughter who didn't really, who lived in town and di who didn't really want to live on the property would sell it when he died. And so he actually saw leasing and the royalties as making the more likely that the property would stay in the family's hands because now it wasn't a millstone around his daughter's neck right where you got to pay the property tax bill every year now it was paying for itself right um so that, yeah that's my answer to that question okay um i'm gonna unmute barb because she did have something that she wrote barb if you could add to what um what we heard from colin did you get unmuted I'm unmuted. Here I am. Thanks. Um, I just said in it, my personal experience is I have uh, 20 acres and I am a third generation property owner. I live on land that my grandfather bought in 1933. I am surrounded by leased land. And in my experience, um, 
really what Colin said is very accurate. People who did lease their land very often did not plan to sell, or if they did, thought that the leasing and royalty money that they had gotten from the act of leasing would more than offset the drop in property value that they might experience because the land was leased. There's another whole thing that um, I don't know if you if you address it in the book, Colin, um, but the whole the whole uh, issue of split estates and that happens a lot with real estate, where people have leased the mineral rights. They sub there's they subsequently sell their property and the new property owner buys it only owning the surface rights. Mm -hmm. So that is really an awful situation because the new owner can then be subject to all of the problems of fracking with none of the income. Now, when you buy the, buy the property, you certainly know that you are buying a split estate that has to be disclosed. But I know there are people who really didn't know quite what that meant. Mm -hmm. So, you know, on your seller's disclosure, there is a question that says, do mineral rights transfer? It's just a simple yes or no question. And you would certainly hope that, that a, a professional realtor would go into depth and explain this to a property buyer, but it doesn't always happen, especially if there's not a realtor involved, it's just a for sale by owner situation. So there's, there's some of that going on too. Um, it's certainly a concern of mine. Um, I. I don't, my property isn't leased. I'm surrounded by, um, by, for the most part, leased land. The township in which I live is one of the larger, geographically, one of the larger townships in like Cumming County. There are currently, last I checked, 263 permanent, permitted gas wells just in my township alone. So I'm literally surrounded. Um, and I, I think about that, but it's, you know, I am fortunately in a financial position where some diminishment of my property value is not my primary concern. My primary concern is that I won't be able to drink my water or swim in the creek that flows through my house, or um, certainly the traffic is an enormous issue and uh, air quality and, and those things. So yeah, uh, I do think there is a disparity between do you own the mineral rights? Did you lease them? Are you getting money? Um, do you did you choose not to lease or did you in worst in the worst possible case scenario did you buy a property that you only own the surface rights um okay i have another question um is actually from maria ocasio i work for penn future she says and some of my area is rural while my co-workers have extremely rural areas. I find it interesting and confirms my own inclination that some issues are not just about finances, but politics and identity. What can we do to encourage more partisan constituents or legislators to offer alternatives that would challenge the identity of the town? So, um, I if, if, I, if he's still here and will allow me to put him on the spot, I would love for Ralph Kisberg to answer that question. And specifically why, so again, there's a lot I didn't talk about that's in the book, including Split Estate Barb, it's there. And Barb is there, Barb is a character in the book, but Ralph is in the book. And specifically, one of the things that I talk about that Ralph does a lot is in some ways, Ralph is like a folk anthropologist who spends a lot of time with people who have leased their land and figures out ways to meet them where they're at, many of whom may be pro-fracking, but are dealing with all of the stuff that comes with fracking that they don't like. And one of the things I talk about in the book is how um, Ralph, in my view anyway, seems to have a fair amount of success in, um, in, in not making his advocacy appear partisan, as partisan as it might appear for certainly from Yoko Ono, um, for instance. Um, but so, Ralph, if you, Ralph, would you like to chime in here? Well, let, let me get the question again because it's late and I didn't have any coffee tonight. <laughs> and while you're thinking about that, Ralph, I will just back up what Colin said. Ralph is a he 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 is a superb diplomat. He really is, and that's what it is called. A diplomat. Diplomacy 
which I don't have. I mean, I'm just like, screw this, you know. <laughs> Ralph is wonderful at that, has always been. So kudos to you, Ralph. Well, uh, that's not always a compliment, but in your, when it comes from you, it is, Barb. Thank you. But uh, Ralph, my, re my reading of the question in short is how do we, it's more like how do we cross the partisan divides with both the constituents and maybe conservative legislatures? Yeah. Uh, find ways that might appeal to people's identity and the identity of the town. Maria, is that, is that, yeah? Okay. It's, it's a very difficult question. I mean, we haven't figured it out, but it doesn't mean we aren't trying. Uh, you know, we, I think as a group, we had a pretty good relationship with our, uh, our state legislator, uh, house representative who was in the rural part of the town. There's one in in the center where the urban area and there's one uh, out. And he, he told me once that about 50% of his constituents had some skin in this game, either a lease or they worked for somebody or a lot of them had, uh, around here we have a lot of hunting camps. So they're associated with their hunting camp and they were getting money that way. So that's a heck of a burden on these legislators uh, from here. The problem is they have an outside influence on the legislature. They go to our guys who get, you know, 80% of the votes and don't really have to do anything to get elected except have an R by their name. Our state senator, for instance, was almost immediately after his first year, I think, was put in charge of the Senate, uh, the Senate Environment and Energy Committee. Now, they used to be separate, but uh, they were put together, which seems crazy too. So, so you really have this uh, problem <laughs> with, with the outside uh, influence of these representatives from here, because I mean, we've had probably over at least half a billion to a billion dollars in royalty. And if you add signing bonuses, it's more, more like a billion in a county of uh, say 120,000 over the past 10 years come into people. So that's all they hear. They hear from them a lot more from us. They don't listen to us. Our, uh, one of our, our house representatives listened, but he never heard anything. But um, so I think it's the other legislatures, the other legislators from the other parts of the state. I mean, the interesting thing to me about this is this was a tremendous land grab, this, this development. Uh, all kinds of mineral rights came with the, with the gas rights. And it's, a, we, there were they least parts of this county where there's no shale at all. I mean, it was just the, there was the price of gas was about four times what it is now when they really the leasing boom was going on. So they threw around money like crazy up to $6,000 an acre to lease your property. Now, the reason they were able to do that is there were a lot of people who were already leased at very low rates, $2, $3 an acre, five. So I mean, billions of dollars, this, this development has destroyed so much capital. And my, I often say that, uh, that oil and gas is a great way to become rich by losing other people's money. And we have to get these messages out that right now, the way we've treated the gas industry has not done them any favors. There's so much coming out of Pennsylvania that the value is much lower than the rest of the country. And it's very hard to make money. Most shale developers don't make money. They can make it if they're really good at hedging. And that's not their core business. They cannot, they cannot consistently so far make a profit on just what they spend to, to build a well, build, develop a well compared to what they bring in. And that's a big problem. And it's becoming a huge problem in the financial sector. So we get these legislators, all they do is hear from these people. There is a lobbyist for every legislator there is in, that's an oil and gas lobbyist. I mean, they're just overwhelmed by constituents who have money, by, by these lobbyists. So how do we get the truth out to them? That's what we have to do. And we're not very good at it. The Republicans, the oil companies are much better at it. They've been, they pioneered the the public relations industry. I mean, it's they have a huge head start. So how, we all have to get much more involved. That's one plan. very small thing I'll add uh, that Ralph and Barb didn't say, but I at least say this in my book, maybe they disagree, but 
Um, one of the signature things, successes that RDA was a major part of was uh, seemingly pr uh, preventing, at least stalling for quite a long time, drilling in a popular part of Loyal Sox State Forest called Rock Run. Um, and one of the things that I think is interesting there is that many people who were not necessarily against fracking were convinced that th because this is public land and they viewed themselves as stakeholders of this land because they were taxpayers and this was where they recreated, that that was an issue, this, this um, and the, you know, they called it, you know, they, they had this campaign to save special places that that crossed to me more than other anti-fracking initiatives it crossed partisan lines uh, in, in ways that, and that doesn't, that doesn't, it's still saying, you know, public land is something different than private land, but it seems to me, it's not an answer to the big question, but I saw it, I say this in the book that I saw that as a, as a major success, not only because they were able to prevent drilling, but because of the way that people who otherwise didn't see themselves as against fracking, they didn't, they didn't see what they were engaged in, in wanting to prevent drilling there as activism, as anti-fracking activism. Um, but, you know, arguably it was. Um, and so I, I sort of saw there's potentially some lessons there. I see there's a number of other people. So I know the, the big answer to your question is really hard. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I have a question for you. Uh, I'm curious about your, uh, Colin, your um, ability to work in that environment. How were you, perceived and welcomed into the community as they knew you were doing this research project? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I will say, I will say I had, I had more anxiety than was warranted um, in, in the sense that, you know, I showed up and uh, I'm, I lived, I live in New York city and I'm a professor at NYU. And, you know, I think there's people have a lot of presumptions, a fair amount of which may be true about the kind of person I am just based on that information. Um, but a couple things. One is I was showing up to an area that as small as it, relatively small as it is, a bunch of journalists had descended there long before me. I mean, there had been several stories in the New York Times on Williamsport in which they had gone out and talked to landowners. Sometimes I would meet somebody that's like, oh yeah, I talked, what, well, so what? I already told my story. Like I told my story to, you know, this one reporter. So it's to say that I think that it, before fracking, if I went to this place, I might have been, there might have been more of a sort of distrust because who's this person and why do they really want to write about us? But I think some people, it was like I was another journalist. Um, and so that doesn't mean that they liked me or trusted me, but I didn't find, I, ha I thought it would be a lot harder to convince people to want to talk to me. I didn't find that to be that hard. Um, another thing that I, you know, so I, I did like an anthropologist. I went and I lived there and I went to church and I went to farmer's market and I went to general stores. I embedded myself in the community as best I could. Um, and, and, and one of the things too that, that, I, had, that I didn't really realize was that um, in, in a place as small as that, there's often multiple ways that people are connected to one another. So one of the things I know as a sociologist is that networks are very stratified. So wealthy people tend to be networked to other wealthy people. Conservatives are networked to other conservatives, liberals to other liberals. And so when you're doing a community study like this, you often need several people who will each be your gateway into one particular relatively closed network. But, you know, I would be talking to someone and, you know, like, uh, I mean, in one instance, it was even someone who was like, a, 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 you know, a conservative farmer but they sat on the Little League World Series board, which meant that they knew the president of Penn College who I was trying to interview. So they connected me to them. So there's all these ways that people were networked across political, class, occupational, educational divides. It doesn't mean that people don't stratify at all, but I actually found that once I had a few people like Ralph especially, who were like willing to introduce me to other people um, and sort of vouch for me that I only needed a few of those to open a lot of doors. Um, and so, so, you know, certainly some people would, some people would say, oh, I already know what you think about fracking. You're, you know, you're from New York City. You're one of those, but like, um, but it, to me, and, and actually, but in some ways it proves, I think it helps prove one of my arguments of the book. Um, I, I didn't, right, I should say Williamsport is a city. I mean, I, I lived in Williamsport. I spent most of my time in the rural areas around Williamsport. There, I should I didn't highlight this enough in the talk. I highlight it in the book. They're very different things. Williamsport itself is a city. It's very, it's relatively liberal. 
Um, you know, it has all of the trap. I mean, it has a first Friday, it has tons of art galleries. I mean, Williamsport, so it's like, when I say, in the book, I make a point of saying greater Williamsport. Um, when I'm talking about rural character and rural life, I'm talking about outside of Williamsport. Certainly Williamsport itself is a relatively liberal bastion. It, it is urban, it has some sidewalks, um, you know, and like art galleries, brewery, microbreweries, yes. So, um, so, but anyway, yeah, I, but while, while there was that skepticism, um, I, I, I felt that, and this is, I mean, I, the last thing I'll say about it is, I think it's the great thing about ethnography versus sort of like just doing interviews is like, some people weren't that excited to talk to me in the beginning. And then they see me again and again and again and again, and they see me with their friend and they see me with their coworker. And it's sort of like this guy, like, you know, like he's everywhere and he knows all the people I know. And so like, once you're there for a while, it really like that resistance kind of, you know, wears down. Yeah. I've got a, uh, I think a two part question from uh, Ron, I think it's Ron or maybe Joanne Rose. Um, how does, first one was, how does eminent domain come into play where you have to sell your property? Um, I guess we'll ask that one first. Yeah, um, I, I have to say at least, at least in my, in what I saw in, you know, where fracking is occurring, not that much. Uh, I, I was talking about this with a few folks before the whole talk began, um, pipelines. I mean, there's this whole, I mean, it's interesting. Fracking occurs mostly in rural areas where people lease their land and not only volunteer, but in some many cases are eager to lease their land. And there really wasn't that much convincing that gas companies had to do. <laughs> um, but pipelines, uh, which are everywhere, because all, where does all this gas go? It goes to suburban and urban, very densely clustered areas for people to put into their homes or cars or whatever, or to be shipped to Europe and other places. So now pipelines are running through very populated areas where it would be very hard, if not impossible in many instances, to get all these individual landowners to agree to, to lease their property. And in addition, they wouldn't make that much money from doing it. If you own a quarter acre stamp, right? And you lease that little quarter acre stamp, or every one of them would demand tons of money and the gas, the, the, the petroleum companies would say, we can't do this. So I did not see the only case of, uh, I did not see cases of eminent domain. It doesn't mean none of them exist, but eminent domain is not the way that petroleum companies are typically taking areas for drilling. Um, that is happening through voluntary leasing, but eminent domain is quite common with pipelines. Uh, and and it, so, so you see a totally different dynamic where people in suburban and urban areas are far more opposed to fracking in general, and then huge fights over pipelines. Um, and it makes sense. Often the, the community is not, you know, there's the person whose backyard it's in or running through didn't want it. Uh, the community gets no financial benefits from having it. They only get the risk. And they're also more likely to be politically liberal as it is. So there's just like, so that's the way that I see eminent domain primarily playing out. So it plays out in a huge way. It plays out on the pipeline side of it, not so much on the drilling side of it. Okay, great. Um, his second part question, uh, is where is all the gas going? I oh, understand yeah. shipping NGL products overseas, but what about the natural gas that's left? Are we yeah. using it all in the US or are we liquefying it for export? Yeah, um, uh, there's, there's, it's changing. I don't have one answer to that because it's changing over time. Um, I mean, the one thing I will say is the sort of, the, the idea that like of energy independence, maybe if it happens, it's actually, a, it, it's actually an accident. I mean, it's just to say the gas is being treated like any other commodity. It goes where it gets the best price. So the idea that we're producing a lot of gas, so now we would uh, stop, or oil, because we're also fracking for oil, that we would stop importing from other countries. Well, not if it was cheaper to import oil from somewhere else to use rather than use our own. I mean, so it's just to say there, they're, and as, as was pointed out, I think in the chat, some people have mentioned uh, there's such a glut of gas. We actually aren't, we don't, we, we don't have the capacity or the interest to use it all that we are quickly either constructing or retrofitting liquefied natural gas facilities to sell it to other places. Um, of course, in central Pennsylvania and Barb and Ralph can tell you this, the, some irony is that um, pipelines may be going right by their house, but most, almost all those residents are not heating their homes with natural gas. Um, they may be heating them with liquid propane, which came from somewhere else and so it's not the case that people in their backyards are now getting natural gas. Um, a lot of Pennsylvania's gas is going to New York, another irony there. I mean, the state of New York has banned fracking, 
but the majority of, of energy in New York comes from fracked gas, most of that from Pennsylvania. And so, um, but it fluctuates, like how much we're importing depends on what the price is. Um, the last thing I'll say about this is a lot of the gas is going up in the air. Um, in most of the Midwest, as I alluded to, they're only interested in the oil. It's because it's much more lucrative. They, they go through the gas to get it and they literally just vent that gas in the atmosphere because the price of gas is so low now that the cost of hooking up pipelines and getting at the market is more, is more than what they would make from doing it. And so a lot of the gas is going right into the atmosphere as greenhouse gas. Okay, um, one more question I see. Craig Farr um, has got a multi-part. So I'm asking, Craig, I'm asking you to unmute and ask your question. So oh, I just wanna introduce myself and say that, first of all, I'm a toxicologist and um, I've studied this a lot. But when I left graduate school, my first uh, job was in Oklahoma and I found out about uh, land rights. And I realized that I could have an oil well in my backyard. So I understand that. Mm -hmm. My biggest concern with the, um, with the fracking is the radionuclides in the water. I mean, they put millions of gallons in. You can't take the, these radionuclides out by water treatment. They're there and they go back into our drinking water. There's nowhere else to put it. So that to me is, you know, a big, big deal. And, you know, when you hit, hit a water supply of your neighbor and you put methane in the water, then their, their water's poisoned and you can't really do anything about that. So um, the other thing I want to say is I'm a, a council person in a borough. I'm on the Collegeville Borough Council. I get the municipal thing, mm -hmm. and um, we've we've had uh, situations where land development wanted to come in, and we couldn't fight it because same same thing. Um, you can't afford can't afford the court costs. So, um, but but the the local rule thing is something that really bothers me because it spreads all the way across our, our, um, our um, you know, our government that, um, you know, Philadelphia tried to pass laws that if your gun was lost and stolen, you had to report it. State legislature said, can't do that. That's our responsibility. They haven't passed that law. So, I'm just saying that there's a lot of similarities across environmental justice and all kinds of social justice. And this whole thing is pervasive in the way our government works in Pennsylvania. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, I kind of have a question, Colin, for you and I guess for, for Barb and, um, and Ralph. Um, some of us here are, are definitely environmental advocates and listening to your very complicated story, my question is, um, how can we be advocates in this situation? What is the way that we're helpful and <laughs> how do we avoid being unhelpful? We did start, Barb's really good at this, um, but you know, you guys have been very helpful. The Delaware River, uh, network and it has done such a great job of preventing uh, you know, the spread of, of the, uh, the territory that they have to frack, keeping it out of the Delaware Basin and New York State and Maryland. Have, we're surrounded by bans on this stuff. People in the Ohio and the Susquehanna River Basin never got a, a shot at that. Um, so and then this has happened in states and in provinces and in countries all over the world. So, I mean, you, you guys are doing things. It's just, how do we get to our legislators? I mean, at this point, we not, we're not doing the gas industry any favors by what we've done, by, by over permitting, by over expanding. And so we need to talk seriously fiscally to them. Uh, we need to do something to, to control this better. Uh, Barb, what, do you have anything to add? 
she may have she may have left oh, no i'm here i was oh, okay oh. um I, certainly your awareness is invaluable and just the fact that you are here learning and you're going to hopefully all buy colin's book um <laughs> and, and 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 spread the word to your friends to your neighbors and when there are actions to be taken by any of the environmental organizations, um, follow their work, uh, sign the petition, write letters to your um, representatives. There are decisions and bills that are being introduced at the federal level to try to put additional regulations in place on methane and on fracking on public lands and on stopping permits for LNG export terminals. There's a, this entire week, actually, there is, it's called the Week of Action and it's being led by the Delaware Riverkeeper Network. Mm -hmm. And there were, uh, Monday was Call Your Legislator Day and Tuesday was, was Tweet and Wednesday was Instagram to try to deny a permit for a, an LNG export terminal in New Jersey. Um, that would impact um, not only you know Pennsylvania but New York and and up into the state um, states where you folks are 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 living and are from. So being aware of what's happening on the federal level is really important. Um, you know, I was not you know just being confessing my own personal politics. I was not a big Biden fan, but I have come to believe that he was probably the only person that could have beat Trump. And um, I was ready to crawl under the bed and never come out for four years if Trump had won the election. It was a really, it was a very scary thing to me. So um, Biden has some some decent plans um, and, and do what you can to help push some of those things through. And, uh, and as Ralph said, even though we didn't seem to make a whole lot of progress in Pennsylvania. We feel good about some of the education that we did in other places. I was on a, a Zoom meeting a month ago and there were folks from Ireland on the Zoom meeting and they had come to Pennsylvania and done what we call the toxic tour and seen the frat fields firsthand as, as Colin lived among us. And they went back home and are trying to push in their in their legislature there in Ireland that the export of liquefied natural gas will be banned permanently. So there's no gas to be fracked in Ireland, but just the fact that they would create a market for it, they're now trying to stop that. So there's certainly pipelines in your area, fight a pipeline, support federal legislation. Um, more of that is gonna be coming down the pike and just um, being aware. The fact that you're here is, um, is is wonderful. So keep it up. Thank you. On whatever level you can. The only thing I would add just really quick because uh, Ralph and Barb said it better, but if you find yourself, and this may not, I'm not saying this describes everyone. If you find yourself as an environmentalist and somebody who is a Democrat or liberal, um, and that I, I, there are some, there are groups, many of them are relatively new, but even just following them on Twitter and reading what they have to say, these conservative environmental groups, uh, I just put two of them in, there's more, but like the, the, the conservative environmental, is that the American Conservation Coalition or something? Um, and then Republic N, uh, but mm -hmm. there, and I see, but basically like uh, you, you know, you may see out of that, I think you can get a sense of what people who are open and pushing for environmental issues, but may not share your politics are saying and thinking. And so you, that in itself, it could be an exercise in seeing the kinds of narratives that can work for people who are not of the same political background as the normal people that you may be networked with that are engaged in activism. That's really important, Colin. Yeah, really important statement. And that's one of the things that, you know, you and Ralph, as I confessed, are much better at than I am. So. Um, <laughs> All right. Hooray right. for the Lincoln Project, you know. Right. Yeah, we're losing players. And there are conservative I'm sorry, Ralph. Were you saying something? Just that, just that the, there are conservative groups beginning to talk about climate change. So 
let's yeah. engage with them. And, and just to add that all the statewide organizations, Penn Future, Penn Environment, the Sierra Club, uh, they do a fantastic job of, of, of getting information to people. And so do we at Responsible Drilling Alliance. Right. With them. All right, I think um, we're at the end of our meeting and I wanna thank everyone for coming tonight and those of you who stayed through the full Q&A uh, for that extra time. And especially want to thank Colin for the great presentation. Um, it was really informative and helpful. And it, it did absolutely change my thinking uh, about how to approach this. So again, thank you very much. Please, my pleasure. It was fun. My first, this is my first Zoom talk. I mean, I've taught <laughs> classes now for two semesters, <laughs> but uh, yeah. <laughs> Where do we buy your book, Colin? Uh, either on Amazon or through Princeton Press. It's not out until April, but it can be pre-ordered. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Be well. Good night. Okay. See you guys. Yeah. I want to see you back in Williamsport for a talk. You know that, right? Absolutely. Good. Yep. All right. That that's gonna happen. I mean. Thank you to the organizers of this. It was great and great job, Colin, for a first time. Really good. Thanks, Barb. Really nice balance of pictures and and. Um, you know, dialogue and, and monologue and good job. Thanks, Barb. Thanks, good night, everybody. Good night. Well, Ralph, thanks, dude. Yeah, thank you, man. I Sorry, I didn't quite understand her question. I, we got to have a signal when I, I don't understand. <laughs> <the question. laughs> and thanks, Rich Britton, if you're still here. Yeah, I'm here. I'm, thank you very thank much you. for staying with us tonight. That was a great talk, Colin. I really thank appreciate you. it. Thank great you. job. All right, I'm going to sign off now, okay? Okay. All right, good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Thanks Pam. Pam. Good night. Good night. I'm going to close the meeting and start downloading the recording. Okay. So we can leave and it won't hurt.